Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. Today is the big launch of, our, of the seminars of this term of MEDIT, and you're, you're all welcome. Um, and this is a, an especially happy occasion because we, this is the first chance for all of us to um, greet Bia Dikka, Dr. Bia Dikka, who is now, uh, has become a research professor in our uh, institute and the university. And we are super proud about that because she won the ETAG Mobilitas Plus Stop Researcher Grant, which was extreme success because only six grants were uh, given out across all fields of research in Estonia, and she was the one to, to, one, to win one of those. So again, congratulations for that, to you and us as well, I guess. <laughs> um, and secondly, we are super happy as well because um, in some sense we have been dreaming about sort of to get going the, the research in the area of uh, virtual and augmented reality. We have been investing into getting the new lab going. However, we have been lacking the people with you know, specialized knowledge and expertise in this area. And, and the fact that we now got you uh, to, to become a member of our team, we, we, there's a lot of hope associated with that, that we, get, that we get this this field of research as well sort of going intensely and, and, and well. So um, without further ado, I will just tell you everybody that the BIAS, the big research project, project title is an active co-presence in narrative virtual reality, a triadic interaction model, and um, I assume that what you will be doing today is more or less give out the uh, overview of what it's all going to what, it, what it's all going to be about and what what expects us in the in the course of the next five years. Oops, um, <laughs> I have to correct you. Uh, thank you for a beautiful, beautiful. Uh, I have my mi ah, microphone okay. here. Um, you, do you hear me? You see me? Well, I'm I'm in a focus. Beautiful. So uh, uh, what I'm going to present today. I'm, first of all, I have to say I'm really, really happy of of. Uh, uh, gaining this position. I'm really happy to, uh, in some sense, come back to uh, BFM because um, I worked here in 2006-2007 as, as a lecturer uh, and, um, and I mean since, since then and throughout the years I've had a really a strong sympathy uh, uh, and uh, towards, towards Tallinn University and to, towards Baltic Film Media School and, and and the work that you are doing here in Estonia. Anyway, so to correct uh, Indrek a little bit of what I'm I'm uh, going to do now is to give an overview of what I've done so far. So um, not um, I will briefly touch the the work on the virtual character, but uh, but uh, basically it's just the overview of, of my expertise and what you can expect from me uh, and uh, the. I also want to uh, kind of uh, emphasize, emphasize, I don't want to, uh, first of all, scare you all up because I'm going to show some neuroscientific studies. So don't be scared of that. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, please feel uh, free to ask questions if that field is not familiar for you and if anything comes up that you, you want to know more about. Um, um, what my research here will be dealing with is, is the, the facial, facial di dynamics between a virtual character and a viewer. And we will be doing uh, also psychophysiological recordings on, on the topic with the Digital Technology Institute. And, uh, and so I'm looking forward also to collaboration in, in that, that respect. But okay, I'm jumping to, the, to my presentation. First of all, of course, like my background is in cinema. So I'm a filmmaker. I've been working in international uh, film productions and, and also directed two feature films and, and currently also developing um, my third feature film to be shot here in Estonia. But then I've also been all, all excited of interactive cinema and analytical structuring and developing models, models uh, of uh, of uh, uh, systems, uh, interactive systems, uh, with with uh, ex expertise in my team, and then have been work doing research on on neurosciences. Uh, the the kind of the 
content of my presentation will uh, first I describe my understanding of narrative cognition. Uh, then we go, to, I discuss a little bit of model of narrative nowness, and, and then we go to the case study of inactive avatar and, and then to the conclusion. I think I have 45 minutes and I have approximately 45 slides, so that means that I will be rushing four and maybe I need to jump a couple of slides depending on how much middle of, uh, of my presentation discussion we have here. But uh, as I said, feel free to interrupt me anytime. Okay, so uh, cognition, I, I would like to suggest that cognition as such should be regarded as narration. So narration is an uh, inseparable aspect of human mind. It's an omniscient umbrella for memory, emotions, learning, anticipation and all these aspects that we, we assign to, to mind, functions of mind. Cognition also, I assume, uh, can be modeled as, as narrative structures. So this is a proposal that uh, I'm putting out. Uh, dynamics of uh, narrative cognition. Uh, so human mind is continuously constructing and reconstructing narratives, Recy recycling what one already knows, which is previous experience, and updating narratives with imagination, anticipation of the future experience, and creating coherence uh, by filling up gaps, as like a sense and meaning making processes. And, and we can find a theoretical background from, for example, from 1960, 1976, from cognitive ecology from Ulrich Neisser, and also like a lot of uh, neuroscientific uh, studies have recently been looking at this as these aspects of human mind. But um, so the human mind is never still, it's dynamically, continuously updating uh, the experience. Uh, my theoretical background builds very strongly on inactive cognitive sciences, uh, which means that our mind is inactive. Um, it's, it's a, we are a part of a dynamically holistic uh, world. Um, we um, our emotional embodied and we are emotionally um, functioning. We are embodied. Uh, we have brain body system tightly connected which is embedded in the world and also extended to the world outside. So uh, when we talk about digital media, uh, for, for example, in, in that sense we have outsourced our uh, skills and abilities to the world. Especially like uh, I can refer to Andy Clark and extended mind ideas on this sense. Um, so. Uh, what I'm interested in is a person-to-person -person interaction, and especially here, narratives, uh, we can see them simulate social interaction. Uh, they establish models of social interaction. They shape human social behavior in general and stimulate physiological body-brain system in a in, uh, person-to-person interaction context. And understanding the other, uh, like uh, how our mind works, we have uh, the functions uh, built in our brain and our body brain system that we understand the actions of the others just by observing them without a verbal, any verbal uh, uh, description. So basically uh, we can refer to mirror neuron studies where um, the neuroscientists have discovered in Italy and also very uh, much work done in, in Finland in Rita Harris uh, research group uh, has been shown that when I when you grasp your mobile phone or I grasp my mobile phone uh, I, I see you grasping the mobile phone pretty much uh, same uh, motor uh, systems uh, activate in my brain when I view observe you acting or I act myself and this is in a very nice way it, it can uh, can we can refer to uh, the um, idea of film or cinema as a mirror, mirroring life. So here, in a, in a nice way, uh, actually, neuroscientific discoveries of mirror system in our brain reflects with the phenomenological and philosophical ideas of, of uh, cinema and narratives mirroring, and that we understand them as, as mirroring the life. The other aspect of, uh, of, uh, of the mind is then uh, 
in more con conscious, conscious level, uh, like we have theories of mind, we know how the world functions, we've seen how people work and behave, and, and so anticipating actions of the other, in addition to unconsciously mirroring the actions of other, kind of uh, forms the other side of, of this very complex system, which we can call human mind, which works with narratives, creates narratives and, and understands comprehends narratives. So um, in my work I, I've um, started to especially emphasize in addition to uh, kind of tracking the facial expressions of, of screen characters or actors on the screen, uh, also uh, like putting more emphasis on the context. So uh, and here we can go back to uh, 1910 on, on the early cinematic studies of Lev Kuleshov, uh, where this is like an already at the anecdotal stage, he is at this Kuleshov effect, where he made an experiment, he had the same male face uh, in, with a neutral look combined with the beautiful woman on the, ben on the sofa, and then a bowl of, bowl of soup, and uh, bowl of soup and a um, coffin of a child, and in this context, asking people, how did you feel? What was the emotional, uh, emotional state of the male character, neutral male character? They always interpreted uh, the emotional state of the character based on the image that was connected to the face. Of course, this is very familiar for the filmmakers. Uh, because this is all about what filmmakers do intuitively or more consciously con connect um, images together and creating, creating different meanings and emotions. However, um, that's new, that's kind of uh, something that, uh, that uh, has to be brought up again and again so that we don't forget, forget the, what um, our early like cinematic ancestors already, already discovered. So um, what we are going to really uh, build, build on, uh, on the understanding that the complexity, the narrative simulate everyday life in its situational and bodily complexity. So uh, embodied experience is always in context. We can't separate uh, body, brain or, or um, surroundings from the actual uh, experience, embodied experience. Um, here I already like a forerunner for the more detailed uh, scientific experiments that have been conducted uh, in my team. I want to bring um, into your attention this um, study by my colleagues, uh, Laura Numema and, and others in Aalto University. Here, uh, this is a very simple um, test uh, where, where uh, they, uh, the test people uh, kind of colored the human body on a web-based uh, interface, human body, uh, depending on the emotion that they experienced. So if they, it, which part of the body you feel activate when you feel anger, which part you of the body you feel that are disactivated when you feel anger, and people did, um, did um, kind of color code uh, the bodies and different emotions. And, and what they could actually find out was that the, the, they could find intersubjectively correlating uh, color codings or codings of the experiences between different, uh, different emotions. So, uh, and, and what I feel is, is a very interesting is that when you actually, actually okay, uh, you can try to imagine anger also in your own, own body and, and, and simulate this, this uh, little uh, miniature man here. Maybe if you simulate an anger and try to kind of create that experience, uh, now uh, you may start to feel similar kind of bodily, bodily, um, bodily uh, senses as, as, as depicted here or depression, where you totally lose power of your hands, where you totally lose power of your legs. So I, I find this really, really exciting um, study, and um, there's a lot of continuing research to, they are doing on, around this 
kind of embodied, embodied uh, or body mapping of emotions. Epistemology of uh, modeling narrative cognition, because all my work is, is basically about, about modeling, trying to model human emotions and model uh, cognitive behavior in an interaction between a virtual character and, and a viewer. So this is the goal of, of the study that I'm going to conduct here. But it builds on a lot of, lot of work that, uh, and, and theoretical thinking that I've been doing before arriving here. So uh, especially important is the tr tr what, what, was it, what is also in my, in my research uh, uh, project title is a triadic interaction model. So triangulation uh, of, of uh, different uh, f uh, kind of uh, dimensions of human e experience. If you think of the movie viewing, so we have narrative structure and we have experience where uh, we get uh, subjective reports of the participants and viewers, how they experience the, the narrative. But then we also have psychophysiology, which means that we are observing related body brain phenomena, which they are not necessarily in control of. And what, what, uh, what my field of study and neurocinematics has actually tried to bring forth in, in addition to working on, on analysis of narrative structure and subjective experiences of that, that uh, viewing a film, for example, is to add another layer of, of observing your unconscious responses, your bodily responses to the, to the narrative. So we can, we can mention, like, for example, arousal and emotions are already, already really important uh, uh, aspects that are actually uncontrollable in the sense that uh, subjective reports we can always manipulate. We can give uh, subjective reports of our experience that don't actually uh, describe uh, uh, properly or honestly our experience of the narrative. When we add the psychophysiology, we may kind of get more detailed information of that. Uh, also, uh, what I'm going to apply to the, f to the study to be conducted here is uh, the model of narrative nowness that, uh, that um, have been developed in my Neurocine team with, with my collaborators. Um, uh, and um, this is actually building on uh, time phenomenology, especially uh, drawing from uh, Francisco Varela's interpretation and analysis of uh, Edmund Husserl's work and also Merleau-Ponty's work and also William James' work on experience of nowness, how we experience presence. Because uh, we, we tend to emphasize the aspect of nowness when we, for example, think of our experience of films. But what, what I would like to suggest is that, uh, I would actually I'd like to ask if uh, nowness exists at all in such a way that it can be claimed to, <laughs> claimed to exist as a moment of time, because uh, our experience of nowness actually um, builds strongly to the past experience, that, that, that all our life experience, and falling forward towards protection. So everything that we experience the, in, the, in the past actually um, builds our anticipation of the future events. So in some sense, in the moment of nowness, we are actually already in the future because we are anticipating that that's, that's what nowness is about, anticipating the future, future events to come. And a very crucial aspect of uh, social interaction and, and, and understanding films and uh, and uh, so, um, so the time span of uh, narratives uh, could be kind of um, ideal for adapting the idea of narrative time structure as a model of cognition, a model of narrative cognition, and so and to model the social person-to-person -person interaction. Okay, um, so story has scenes, and, and then it has a really small small parts, which I like to call proto narratives. Um, which are kind of so shortest uh, socio-emotionally meaningful small-scale events, it happens in milliseconds. So these, these events are really important in human-human interaction, in, in also in movies. If, if there's any editors, film editors here, so you know how important it is to just 
one frame can really matter if you cut that frame in or out. And, and so we are tol talking about this type of very short moments, which um, I like to emphasize in, in, in the research. And um, so I can say, for example, an example would, would be a feeling of uh, rejection. So turning your eyes away from me, in milliseconds, I would understand that I would I could understand this as a rejection of the message I'm sending from here. So we are talking about about uh, events that are really meaningful in social interaction, but actually take place in in milliseconds, even in the shortest sense. <laughs> um, okay, so um, actually I could check check my time. So. Um, Physiological experiments. This is this is the kind of the part that uh, that um, what I would say that in many art schools uh, kind of scares people up or or gets a very uh, strong uh, rejection response because we are moving to the domain of sciences and neurosciences. And, uh, and unfortunately, uh, there is a kind of big um, emotional traditional gap between arts and sciences, which, uh, which I'm here. To tr One of my tasks is trying to, trying to construct a bridge between, between artists and, and scientists and, and find ways to collaborate together. Okay, but uh, so I've been working with physiological experiments uh, with movies and especially with the method of uh, free viewing of movies in the heavy duty brain scanner, functional magnetic resonance imaging, which means that you are pushed into the tube, laying down and pushed into the tube and you watch the movies as a back projection and, and you, have, you get the sound coming from your ears. So when, when, uh, all, with all these experiments, we are dealing with a kind of a heavy duty brain scanning which is used as a, as a medical and a clinical studies in hospitals and uh, especially in time. This is Aki Kaurismäki film from uh, 1990 something, 91. Uh, Match Factory Girl is uh, one of the first films that uh, gained international reputation. Is it tasty? Yes. What you see here, the orange blots, blobs are the points in the brain. If you think there's something between us, you are mistaken. Nothing could touch me less than... It would be best if you would go away. Okay, very rude scene, emotionally and, and socially rude scene. This is what happens in the brain when, in the moments when the subject viewing the film actually uh, experience the events in really similar manner. So suddenly we can see inter strong intercepted correlation between different viewers who have been viewing the film separ separately in brain scanner and still at that, mo at that point uh, you can see such a, such a wide uh, range of intercepted correlation. So this is what I'm talking about. And this is the only thing we can actually see from, from using this method because um, this uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging method can only uh, use uh, statistical strength. So you have to have several people with a similar kind of experience in order to extract information. You can't tell uh, what are the individual <laughs> thoughts of each person. You can only see uh, and get hold of, of the intersubject correlation between, between those people. But this uh, shows pretty, pretty nicely what, what uh, neurocinematics is about and what, what we can gain, gain with it. We can uh, get, a, get a kind of identify brain regions in a certain time windows where 
uh, in relation to certain uh, narrative context that uh, that uh, an in infer from that information. What what uh, this is one of my my first studies that um, I did with my Neurocine research group. So uh, we showed uh, Finnish uh, film director Sara Kantel's uh, episode film one episode. And um, for our test people, what are you doing, mom? Okay, it's it's a it's a dramatic story, story dramatic scene of a of a young girl witnessing her mother's uh, nerves breakdown. Um, a strong, dramatically and emotionally strong scene. Uh, notably, no cuts. It's shot with one one um, handheld camera with one one shot only, so there are no cuts. With with this. With this, um, trying to get my sound away. So uh, we use this uh, episode film and and the screenplay of that episode film, which was synchronized uh, to the text slides, so that uh, all the events uh, were synchronized with the actual film events. And the idea uh, with uh, with um, looking at the data collected while people read the script and data collected while they view the film was uh, to look at the moments, uh, those brain areas where these are uh, the, where uh, in both groups the activation coincided, that correlated, so that in some sense we could uh, distract from uh, the, the narrative experience, we could extract the media, uh, the, um, the, the, like um, the qualities of the media, so video, sound, audiovisual, and text reading, and uh, and in and that sense, what I'm claiming that we could we could actually get hold of the those brain areas that are most that we can refer to the narrative content itself beyond the actual stimuli qualities of if it's a film or if it's a reading, so. Um, this is this is one of the projects that we've done. Another project was that we I wanted to look at the, how uh, differently brain functions when we are viewing a drama film as seen before, and then an experimental black and white film, where which is beautifully shot. Maya Deren at Land beautifully designed, shot and acted film, but I mean to honestly. Viewing this film hundreds of times, it's very difficult to uh, kind of figure out what it is all about. So there's no plot in that sense, I would say. Uh, okay, you may argue with me then, with, with this, uh, with me. But uh, but uh, the point is that in no point of the film you actually get a clear understanding of the motivation of the character and and the kind of the dramatic drive of the character where he, she's aiming at while in this, this other film it's pretty clear, the dramatic sense. So we could uh, sep kind of show differences in functional connectivity in this case between, between these two films. The so blue spots are related to uh, the drama film and, and red plops relate, show uh, the spots of uh, functional connectivity for the black and white experimental film. And once again, this is, this is without going into the details of the analysis here, just to show you that with this method, it is possible to find, find like um, regions and functions of the brain that connect to the different aspects of the, of the moving image. And for example, perceiving, perceiving uh, images, uh, visual or audiovisual, uh, visual or uh, auditive, uh, and imagining those, uh, we get different different brain activation. So also the imagination uh, takes place in different parts of the brain than actually the perceiving the images. 
we can come to this de de uh, and um, details in the discussion if if you uh, want to know more about this. But um, this is like why the major study that that I, I want to introduce here is the the study that we did. We showed a memento film in full um, in 35 minute sections, three times 35 minutes to uh, 13 uh, subjects. And uh, I think here is a kind of a um, king idea or queen idea uh, is that uh, the film, who, how many of you have seen Memento film? So it, it's constructed so that you see first the final, final uh, events of the, of the plot of the story and then it gradually unfolds backwards. So each time when you get a new scene you can add to the previous knowledge of what you learned from, from the final outcome. Uh, and when I realized that, uh, that this film actually has uh, 15 points where one particular shot uh, is, rep is repeated. So you have um, a shot that is uh, uh, seen uh, without, uh, without uh, and, and for, so here the man jumping on the windshield, that's one of those moments which repeats a second time in the film. And so I, I realized that at these points of this repetitive uh, shot emerging, you actually do a reconstruction of, of the narrative. <coughs> and um, what, what, what is important here is to emphasize that, um, that in general, it's really difficult to get hold of uh, the kind of um, individual floats of the thoughts in the human mind when one is watching the movie, uh, especially like uh, those moments where you could actually capture a certain or argue that uh, or assume that certain time window within the movie is the that particular time frame where all the viewers are most probably doing similar kind of cognitive uh, fun uh, cognitive um, efforts. So here I was assuming that at these points when, when you have, um, I mean first you have a see, you see the shot in the flow of the images but, but you don't know that that's, that's the one that will be repeated, you don't expect that and, and it's repeated here so you immediately calculate okay this scene and that scene actually go together and that in that moment you do a, a reconstruction of the brain. And what we discovered, uh, so we could identify uh, certain parts of the brain that are actually uh, functioning similarly between different people at these particular moments of the time. And, and they do so only at these particular moments of time, not, or not elsewhere in the film. So, uh, so it's, it's kind of the assumption is that these regions of human brain do execute a continuous sense making and reconstruction of the current situation in a dramatic narrative context. Uh, and so there's this uh, retention and, and protection processes involved. And same functions are assumed also to sense making, any sense making processes in everyday social context. But this is for future aspects. Okay, so we are getting closer to the, to the uh, study the inactive, uh, inactive um, system of narrative system that uh, we will be developing and, and studying here. Uh, so in, in some sense you can, you can imagine, okay, enact, this is, this is um, from my obsession film, uh, inactive cinema installation obsession, the image, but basically viewing process, psychophysiological experience is tracked with sensor measurements um, fed to the montage machine, recombined to the to the narrative, either generated on fly or using using prefixed media clips, retrieving and presenting and and creating such a loop between the film screen, the events on the film screen and the and the viewer. So this is a um, kind of a kind of a model model of a skeleton of the inactive inactive loop and inactive experience happening in an unconscious manner so inactive uh, differentiating from 
interactive, where you actively manipulate the scenes and events in an active, you feel and live by the events, and this, this bodily experience is tracked and interpreted back to the story. So um, this is, I think, is closer to a movie experience, an immersive movie experience, while the interactive, uh, act kind of active manipulation of the events then turns more to the gaming desires that the gaming has, where you really have, feel the power over what's happening, while in an active you live by and experience in that, that way, like more like in natural social interaction, you experience the events. Okay, any questions so far? Many questions, okay, <laughs> later. Uh, so, what, what I like to use, I like to use the concept of cognitive branching, and this is different it's from interactive uh, material branching. Material branching, of course, you know, for producers is like a, um, pain, um, pea valu, yeah, yeah, pea valu for producers, the, the material branching, because you have to produce huge amount of material in order to create different tracks of the story. But uh, in, in cognitive branching, we are talking about this effect that, as I already referred to, all the film editors, especially. Um, manage really well, which is that by changing a little, something a little here changes your whole attitude, how you see the next uh, fixed, uh, fixed kind of a linear scene. So we can imagine that uh, cognitive branching can be created uh, by changing the sound environment simply, like having nostalgic sound environment or having like erotically loaded sound environment that totally completely changes how you see the next um, linear sequence. In that sense, uh, I was saying that if you cut, cut before the main character turning eyes away or you take the turning eyes away into the editing, um, that already can have enormous effect on, on the story and how you interpret the story. So uh, this is similar to the ways that the, the games are constructed. So you have like fixed uh, linear scene, scenes and then you have scenes where the gamer can actually participate and, and affect, affect the game. And, and, um, but here we are once again talking about unconscious psychophysiological responses tracked. Um, okay, inactive avatar. So it's a, it's a case study. Um, it's kind of a continuation of the dream that I had after working with uh, uh, media clips uh, with interactive or um, inactive cinema installation where you, I had fixed media clips and uh, already that time I started to dream about the ability to be able to change the color seams of the and, and you know manipulate those fixed media clips because uh, building up uh, kind of uh, continuously uh, remontaged uh, uh, mon montas, um, you want to have some kind of um, control over over the media clips and their their kind of uh, content. Anyway, so um, also um, because uh, so that's that's the time when I started to really develop uh, and 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 became my kind of obsession to work on. A, Photo, photo realistically, photographically identical uh, cinema characters. So we have a live actress and then in certain scenes, facial close-up scenes, we would have identical to the actress, we would have identical uh, avatar and, and whose behavior we, would, we could control. And here, uh, especially um, so I'm focusing especially on cinematic narratives and, and uh, on the, on the facial, facial uh, expressions on close-ups of, of cinematic narratives at this moment. And here we have especially like, then we have like direct eye gaze 
which invites the viewer into an inactive non-verbal dialogue. And um, there can be modifications of expressions and, and physiologic, psychological moods of, of, of the character on the fly. What, what will be produced is an, an inactive, what I call inactive co-presence. It's, a, it's, a, it's events that take place in, in a dramatic narrative context. We have an, a virtual character and we have an experiencing human. So this inactive co-presence is kind of a, a, an emotive cognitive feedback loop. And here we have the, the, the human, experiencing human, the understanding of and living by the character's dramatic situation, uh, feel of empathy or compassion, and projecting hers, uh, this uh, emotive cognitive interpretation, to one's reading of the face, facial um, expressions. It's a feel of sharing. And, and reading character's next expressions as a response to one's own feelings, or there's a feel of turn taking. So, this experience of the human, human viewer is uh, reflected and tracked in the physiological responses. And the character behavior then in this inactive feedback loop. So the character behavior on the other hand, it directs or it has some control in real time for the viewer's psychophysiological um, responses or emotional responses. So, and the context here defines the dramatic situatedness of the character so elicits, el elicits the feel of empathy or compassion in the viewer. And the sub subtle facial uh, expressions for the, the multiplicity of emotive cognitive interpretation for the viewer experience and, and feel of sharing. And synchronization of the changes in, in the um, avatar's uh, facial expressions um, to viewer's tracked uh, responses uh, that elicits the feel of turn taking. So in, in some sense, we are uh, building here um, real, real uh, like um, close to real social interaction situation of, uh, of uh, real social interaction between two feeling and experiencing people, especially uh, with uh, emphasis on turn taking. So it's not imitating the other, and the responses are not necessarily like uh, you you feeling feeling uh, like um, sad. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the character expresses sad sad feel, feelings, or but uh, it depends on the context how 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 that that is going to be working. Anyway. Uh, I have a demo of inactive avatar, um, which I built together with a uh, with, um, couple of students from uh, Metropolia, from animation studio, and uh, with uh, my very close and dear collaborator, Peter Schurt, who is a visual effect uh, designer, supervisor of um, Lars von Trier, for example. So all the work that Lars von Trier has done, uh, Peter Schurt has his fingers on the work. And Peter Hurt is especially interested in this, this uh, uh, kind of photographically uh, created um, human face. So I let the video talk, talk on its side. About our uh, Unity version of the uh, inactive avatar. And it's a single scene from the Maiden of Dusk project uh, as a Unity uh, inactive avatar. So we did uh, some tests with uh, subsurface scattering and various forms of facial action uh, and ended up doing a 3D model of Maria from uh, photogrammetry uh, that was later refined in, uh, in Blender. Uh, we used uh, some live action footage uh, we shot actually 4K uh, stereo of Maria in the bathtub for the scene. And we did a Sendai's tracking of that uh, from the stereo footage. Also, you see reflections in the water surface that was shot as a separate live action shoot. And this was uh, later put into uh, Unity, uh, where we have, uh, of course, some facial action. 
and we have uh, eyes that are a separate 3D element that can be manipulated. Uh, they have a default behavior and they can be manipulated by mouse clicks. And also we have the possibility to turn Maria's head a little bit. And uh, we have the water ripple effect and some generated sound. So everything comes together. It's a little bit hard to show this, of course, in a, in a video clip. You have to sit there and experience the, the native uh, features. But you can see that I have some degree of, of uh, control of what Maria is, is doing. So, um, so here, um, to repeat, um, so this is a kind of proof of concept of the idea of, uh, of the triadic uh, interaction where we have uh, the independent um, viewer, human, human mind viewer. Then we have a, a screen character that we can understand as an independent character also. And then we have the fictional context. So there are three different uh, aspects that are, are manipulated or that we, we can um, kind of, that we um, are, are included in this, in this. Okay, yeah. So um, any questions of this? Basically, basically, how the so here um, it was simplified in that sense that we have mouse clicks that uh, show the control plausible uh, feedback from the viewer, and and Maria's um, eyes were moving according to you know the movements of the mouse, and uh, and uh, then we had uh, water ripples in the background which you can imagine that there's a sound sound that is uh, like a very strong. Uh, thunderstorm breaking above you, a very strong sound and a lot of water triples and then you have a distant sound and a couple of water triples. So that already creates a different kind of feeling and, 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 and context. So it, it kind of exemplifies the modification of the context with, for the avatar. Okay, but, but um, kind of a proof Hello. of concept um, as such. And uh, we are at the conclusion. <laughs> so en enactive mind theory is really an explanatory framework for that I, I draw from for this dynamically holistic narrative cognition. And narrative reconstruction as the elementary constituent of enactive cognition and related predictive processes. Uh, the model of narrative nowness uh, with the retention and protention uh, describes time and context dependent narrative dynamics and person to person interaction in social context. And uh, then, like the, finally, the inactive avatar view, a co presence, should, should somehow model the real time simulation of person to person interaction. So, ready for the questions? Thank you.